Oh, man, Stephen and, and Ben, thank you guys so much. Can you help me say thank you to the team? Wow. It is so good to worship with you. My name's Ryan, and um, I uh, get the chance to pastor a church down in North San Diego County um, named Emmanuel Faith. San any San Diego people here? Right on. Uh, it actually is one of those churches with the orange carpet that Mark mentioned this morning, and um, Actually, uh, we don't still have the orange carpet. It is, it is a legacy church. So we've been around for 84 years. We did have the orange carpet in the 70s. It was replaced by mauve carpet in the 90s. Some mauve fans in the house, wonderful. And um, during COVID, we remodeled and updated a little bit. So we lost a little bit of our swagger. Um, but it is a great church. It's an intergenerational, interethnic church and um, absolutely love uh, pastoring it. And I love being up here at Mount Hermon. Uh, something unique seems to happen when God's people gather here together. Um, the, the, in Celtic spirituality, there's this idea of thin space. Have you heard that term? Thin space is, um, the, the Celts sort of describe it like this. It's a, it's a place where the overlap between heaven and earth is, is, is a bit muddy. It's a bit thin, places where people interact with and connect with God in unique ways. And this just seems to be one of those places. And I've been praying that our time in the scriptures over the course of this week would be just that. Would you bow your head and let's pray and ask God to speak through his word. So Lord, here we are. In all the, the chaos of, of getting our families here, driving up here, rushing around, we just want to pause and sort of let our soul catch up with our body. We just want to be present with you and with one another. And Jesus, we want to meet with you. We want to hear your voice above all the others. So Lord, my... my prayer tonight is that you would speak and that you would speak loudly for the glory of your name, please. In Jesus' name. God's people together say, amen. 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 It was March 22nd of 2023 when a number of tech gurus wrote an open letter pleading for the ceasing of the development of AI labs. They wanted them to stop. They, they noticed that there were some dangers on the horizon. Listen to part of what they wrote in that letter. They said, advanced AI could represent a profound change in the history of life on earth, and it should be planned for and managed with commensurate care and resources. They went on to wrestle in this letter with questions like, should we allow robots to replace like all jobs, in, including ones that we love? Should we allow the development of non-human minds to outnumber, outsmart, and eventually replace human minds? Should we risk the loss of our civilization? Should we let computers and bots write term papers and sermons for us? Okay, that, that was my addition to it, but... And the plea in this letter was to get some sort of leadership structure in place because people that have their finger on the pulse of what's going on are starting to get a bit nervous. They're saying, listen, let's, let's pause this before it gets out of hand if it hasn't already. Because it's one thing to have your pho delivered by a robot in a restaurant, right? Or go to a self-checkout aisle in the grocery store, but it's a whole other thing to help have self-driving cars and weapons programmed for destruction just operating on their own. Can I get an amen? Those are two different things. In 1818, English author Mary Shelley painted her famous work. Anybody know it? Frankenstein. Frankenstein. The plot revolved around a doctor, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, who created a way scientifically to take parts from a graveyard, fashioned them together, and he created a monster. And that monster went on to wreak havoc and destroyed people and destroyed lives. And before he could rein it in, that monster started to take over. 
Her novel feels more prophetic today than it ever has before. And see, the problem with Frankenstein and artificial intelligence is something impersonal creating, something impersonal having power, power to use for either good or evil. And if if unchecked, who knows where this could go and who knows what could happen with civilization. So what happens if impersonal beings start having the ability to create on their own? How would we be able to stop the proliferation of evil and destruction in our midst? Now, Shelley was wrestling with that idea back in 1818, and for the past 200 years, we have been wrestling with questions like that, questions of depersonalization, questions about autonomization, questions about artificial intelligence against genuine personhood. But I would suggest to you that those questions are way older than 200 years old. I think they are questions as old as time. So let me, let me put it like this. Let me put it like this. If, if an impersonal being created us, who cares if impersonal beings continue to create? If impersonal beings, if AI is created in the image of lowercase g God, Who cares if they begin to take over? See, these are questions that transcend just our cultural moment, and they go to the core of existence. They go to the core of why are we here? They go to the core of what it means to to be created in the image of God, what it means to be human, what it means to have meaning and purpose in this life that we live. And those questions are at the very heart of John's gospel. See, John was one of Jesus' best friends. In fact, he would tell you that he was the one who Jesus loved. Now, if you write your own gospel, you're allowed to say that, okay? (laughs) And most scholars think that he wrote, John wrote his work between 85 and 95 AD. So it was the the last gospel written. Um, And so John is sort of riffing off of the other gospels, but 90% of what he wrote in his gospel is unique to him. A gospel is is part biography, it's part history, it's part theology, but it's 100% good news. And the thing that I love about John's gospel is he tells us exactly why he wrote it. Listen to what he said. The, towards the end of his gospel, he says this, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written, so, so, so I chose to write these ones down for you, John says. I, I, I picked and, and I drew out what I felt like was the best of the best. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have what? Say it with me, Mount Hermon. You may have a life in his name. And everything we're going to talk about over the next few days together are focused on what it means to have life in his name, what it means to be the kind of people who receive from him and walk in his way with his heart. And my prayer for all of us has been that Jesus would awaken that new kind of life in us over the next few days. You with me? If you have your Bible, open with me to John chapter 1, because that's where we're going to start tonight. John chapter 1. In her essay, the fisherwoman's daughter, Ursula Leguin, wrote, first sentences are doors to worlds. And what she meant by that is that great authors have this way of of just drawing you in from the very beginning. Like somebody reeling back a kite, they pull you into the story. So, So we know a few famous first lines from books. My guess is you've heard this one. It was the best of times, it was the... Where's the time? Okay, so you've heard this before, okay? It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. The sentence goes on, but when you're Charles Dickens, you can write a run on sentence and it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> and he just reels you in. John does the exact same thing at the beginning of his gospel. First sentences are doors to worlds. In the beginning was the Word, 
And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, my guess is, by the way that you're responding, those are words that you've heard before. But my prayer has been, my hope has been that we would just tonight just be in awe once again of these first 70 words in John's gospel. Because John doesn't begin his story about Jesus with Jesus lying in a manger in Bethlehem. He begins his story about Jesus by talking about the creation of everything that we see around us. He begins his story about Jesus by talking about the cosmos. He begins his story about Jesus by talking about existence and the ground of existence itself. See, these first two verses of John's gospel um, are sort of akin to um, like a junior high dance, okay? Because you have two ideas that are sort of diametrically opposed to one another. Think guys on one side of the gym and gals on the other side. And by the end of these first two verses, John is going to bring these two diametrically opposed ideas to the middle of the dance floor. And by the end of it, it's going to seem like they're dancing their first dance at a wedding. The first idea is in the beginning. In the beginning is the very first few words of what? of the whole story. <laughs> Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created. And so John is sort of, um, he, he's riffing with his Hebrew readers. He's, he's introducing them or reintroducing them to the story that they've heard, that they grew up on. But then he says, in the beginning was the, what? Word. Was a word. In the beginning was the word. And that word, word, in the Greek is the word logos. My guess is you, you've probably heard about it. Uh, it. It means like a statement or a speech or an embodying idea. There's this famous painting called The, the School of Athens. It was painted by uh, Raphael in around 1511. And it, it's a number of the great ph gr Greek philosophers ever to live. But if you look sort of front and center, like almost closest to us, there's a guy by the name of Heraclitus. And um, let me zoom in on him so you can see him. Because Heraclitus um, was writing in Ephesus, which is the exact same place that John was writing. Now, he was writing a few hundred years before that, around the 6th century. And you may not have heard of Heraclitus, but my guess is you've heard of at least one of his ideas. Heraclitus was the guy who said, you will never stand in the same river twice. You heard that? And he had this idea about the world that we lived in that it just felt a little bit chaotic, ever-changing. You never stand in the same river twice. And so he came up with this idea that underneath all the chaos is something holding us. He called that something logos. He, he would have described it maybe a, a little bit like in an embodying idea or divine reason or logic or something that controls the universe. If he had seen Star Wars, he would have called it the force. <laughs> and his idea was developed by Greek minds. Logos became to be sort of known, or, or the idea was that it was like the mind of God that controlled the world and people. But when they talked about God, they were talking about an impersonal being. And by the time John is writing his gospel, Plato had already written about the Logos, and listen to what Plato said. It may be that someday there will come forth from God a word, a Logos, who will reveal all mysteries and make everything plain. And John is like, hold my Bible while I introduce you to Jesus. Because if you know your scriptures, you know that in a few verses, John is going to say, and the word or the logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John gives the Logos a name. And so he's brought both these Hebrew minds in the beginning and these Greek minds, 
logos. Together to the middle of the dance floor, he's offended both of them, but invited them into the party. Listen once again to John chapter 1. With Jesus in place of logos. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. And both the Greeks and the Hebrews just went, <laughs> minds blown. John starts his story at the very beginning, not at the beginning of Jesus' earthly life, but at the beginning of life, period, at the beginning of existence. And John tells us that before Jesus had a body, Jesus was somebody, that Jesus existed before he was incarnate. He was with God, creating everything. He was God. It turns out the story of Jesus is way bigger than the 33 years that he spent walking this earth, healing people, casting out demons, forgiving sins, way bigger than even those things. And John is making this point that at the center of the universe is the person of Jesus not an impersonal force, not an impersonal force, not an organizing principle, but personhood, not something, but, but someone, not a what, but a who, not an enigmatic mystery, but, but someone who's knowable, not distant, but, but near. And John does all of this because he wants to introduce his readers to the one who changed his life. And he wants to invite them into the world of following Jesus. And he did it. He did it by using this one word, this word, flesh. He became flesh. And John, you almost feel like he's trying to create tension. He's trying to offend. Because it's a word that would have been so diametrically opposed to the word logos. Right? He could have chosen, and he became a man or he became a human being. But John wants to push the envelope, and he says, he became flesh. It's almost a crude word. I love the way that, that poet George Herbert put it when he said this, the God of power, as he did ride, in his majestic robes of glory, resolved to light, and so one day, he did descend, undressing all the way. I think of the Apostle Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. He emptied himself. Or as the poet said, he undressed all the way. The one who made the stars is in the dirt. The one crowned in glory is in a position of humility. And for us, we might go, okay, well, like, why? Why? Jesus, why did you do that? God, why was that the plan from the very beginning? And listen to what he says. John tells us. He says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, this is the good news, friends. This is the gospel. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? Say it with me, Mount Hermon. Children of, Children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but born of God. If you hear nothing else, hear this, that there is a personal God who created you personally and loves you personally to the extent that he was willing to clothe himself in flesh, come to your rescue so that you didn't spin off into oblivion to dwell with you, to die for you, to pay the penalty for your sin, to redeem you, all that you might become children of the Most High God. Somebody say amen. amen. I love the way that Eugene Peterson put this in his paraphrase, the message. He said, in, in verse 12, he said, he made them, talking about us, he made us to be their true selves. 
their child of God selves. I love that because Eugene Peterson, I think, captures so poignantly the reality that becoming children of God is about becoming who God always designed us to be, who he created us to be. He's calling us back to himself. He's calling us back to the reason and to the way that he created us to live. And I think, I don't know about you, but I go, man, being my true self, like, sign me up for that. I want some of that. But that's also really painful and hard sometimes, isn't it? Because being our true self and becoming our true self means we have to get out from behind the, the fig leaf. It means we have to get honest about some of the things that we're wrestling with. It's a lot easier to put out that false self for people to see. But here's the other implication. Here's the other implication. And, and I know this isn't a popular idea in our day and our time, but um, my, my goal isn't to be popular. It's to to preach truth. And the truth of the matter is that it is impossible to be who you were designed to be apart from the God who created you. It's impossible. So Jesus comes that we might become our true child of God selves. He became what we are that we might become what he is. And I want to paint for you a, a picture of what, what the incarnation does. I know you may be aware of this, but um, when uh, uh, Mama Zebra has a baby, for the first two days of that foal's life, that Mama Zebra will take that baby away with her, and it'll just be them two together for two days. And that mama will spend time allowing her baby to get to know her. Each zebra's stripes are unique to that zebra. Did you know that? It's like a fingerprint that they have. And so the mama wants the baby to see this is who I am. I'm your mom. I love you. She wants that baby to get her smell and to sort of imprint it in her being. She wants her to know, with me, you're safe. With me, you'll always have enough. With me, you're going to be okay. And for two days, she brings that baby zebra away from the rest of the zebras, away from the herd, and it's just them two looking at each other, her imprinting her love onto that baby. And here's the truth of the matter, friends. Incarnation is about imprinting. It's about the God of the universe coming to us and imprinting his love and his mercy and his grace on us us. The incarnation is Jesus coming to us, looking at us eye to eye, face to face, and saying, I love you. You're safe with me. You'll always have enough with me. I, I will not leave you. I will not let you down. I am for you. I'm your God. I'm your God. And over the rest of the few verses in John, the next four verses through the beginning of what we call the prologue of John. John tells us what Jesus wants to imprint on us. And I just want to give you four things in the rest of the time that we have together tonight that Jesus wants to imprint on us through the incarnation. Listen to the first one. John wrote this, and he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his what? Glory, glory. glory. One of the things I love about John's gospel is that he's telling a recreation story in the beginning, but he's also retelling Israel's story. And remember, there's a story in Exodus chapter 33 where Moses said to God, God, show me your what? Glory. glory. Show me your glory. Listen to it. Oh, I didn't put it up there. Here's what it says. Moses says to God, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the story goes that God passes by Moses, and Moses is sort of allowed to see the backside of God. It's as though these like breadcrumbs are just being thrown down. 
He's surrounded by presence, but he isn't able to look on the glory of God directly because if he does, he will die. And what John tells us is now that Jesus has come, you and I get the beautiful invitation to gaze on the glory of God in the face of Jesus. In John chapter two, John will tell us that Jesus does this miracle. We're actually gonna look at it tomorrow night together where he turns water into wine and it says that he manifested his glory. But did you know that Jesus manifesting his glory to his people did not end when he ascended to heaven? The apostle Paul would write to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter three and he would say this, we all with unveiled faces are beholding the glory of the Lord. And in beholding his glory, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. See, here's what Jesus wants to imprint on you through the incarnation. He wants you and I to come awake to wonder. He wants you and I to be captured once again with the beauty and the majesty and the weightiness of God and not just to read about it and not just to hear about it and not just to sort of secondhand listen to experiences about it, but to meet with him face to face, one degree of glory to the next. So let me ask you this. When was the last time that you were just captivated with the beauty of God? When was the last time that that God just sort of took your breath away and you just, you had to stop in your tracks and you had to go, God, I just just wanna throw up my hands and worship. When was the last time his majesty and his holiness and his awe just captured you? See, Jesus, like that mama zebra, wants to look at you tonight and he just wants you to take in his majesty and take in his glory and take in his holiness. Do you see it? Do you see it? The personal God who created you wants to know you personally and he's inviting you to say back to him tonight, show me your glory. And he says, I will. I will. Listen to the next thing that John tells us about the imprinting of the glory of Jesus. He says this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of what? Grace. Now stop there. I know, I know you probably know the rest of it, but let's just stop there. Full of grace. Now, he's already told us that when we believe, we become children of God. So what you believe will eventually determine what you become. What you receive will determine what you become. And so here he's telling us, when we look at Jesus face to face, eye to eye, what we receive and what we take in is grace. Not only that, but he'll go on to say, grace upon grace. As if to say, it never runs out and it never runs dry. Um, One lexicon that I read said that, that grace means that we are people who freely receive God's favor because he is always leaning toward us in love. Like, think back to that picture, that mama zebra looking at her full, always leaning toward us in love. God is leaning toward you tonight because as his children, we are formed in favor. We are formed in favor. My, my wife, Kelly, and I, we met guiding backpacking uh, trips for Young Life. We were both backpacking guides. And we guided long enough ago that um, we didn't have GPSs out on the trail. We just had topographic maps. Does anybody remember those? Okay, going backpacking with, you lay, I, I love, I'm a map guy, I love topo maps, and we would always sort of plan out our trail loosely before the week started. And uh, if you look at a topo map, there's two different kinds of rivers on a topo map. Um, there's one that's called an intermittent stream, and it's a dotted line on a topo map. And that means that at certain times in the year, that stream is flowing and that stream is running, typically um, late spring, early summer, when there's still snow melt, or um, this year, they'll be running all year. 
because we have had so much snow that it's crazy. But typically, an intermittent stream isn't running all year. So you could plan your trip knowing, like, we're probably going to get to this stream and there's not going to be a way to fill up our water bottles. But a perennial stream is completely different. It's usually fed by like a ground water or a spring, and it is running all year, and it's usually running pretty hard all year. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Which type of stream is the grace of God? Is it an intermittent stream? Or like we, we stick the dismount, we nail it, and God's like, oh, Ryan, like, I'm, I'm so proud of you. I'm so grateful for you. My favor is now on you. Is that what the grace of God is like? No, no. the apostle John just told us that, that Jesus gives us grace upon grace, that his grace is like that perennial stream. It is always coming full-fledged toward our heart at all times. If you've sinned sexually, grace upon grace. If you've wronged someone and you're like, gosh, I just, I wish I could take that back, grace upon grace. If you didn't handle a conflict well and you're just beating yourself up, grace upon grace. If you've battled addiction, grace upon grace. If you've run out of energy and you're absolutely exhausted, grace upon grace. Friends, the grace of God is a perennial stream. It is always flowing. It is always coming towards you because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. God's grace will never run dry in your life ever, ever. It never dries up. Where sin increases, grace increases all the more. But Jesus is not just full of grace. John goes on and he says he's full of grace and what? And truth. And truth. That word truth is a really sort of um, interesting word. It, you know it's come under attack of late. Um, truth simply means that which aligns with reality which makes the statement like, well, that's just my truth and that's your truth and my truth is my truth. It, it makes those statements um, a, a, a bit precarious, like hard, a, a bit slippery, like hard to understand because it just doesn't correspond to the way that the word actually functions. One of the best ways, one of the best ways to think about that word truth is to think of it like, like an arrow. So an arrow flies true when the arrow is straight, when you pull it back, and when you let it go, and when that arrow is true, it will fly through the air, and it will go and hit the bullseye that it was designed to hit. And the same is true for a life. When a life is true, it will go and it will hit the bullseye that it was designed to hit. When we live in truth, we live the life that God designed us to live. And here's what John is telling us about Jesus. You've never seen somebody live out the calling of God on their life, live in the truth of God like Jesus. You look at him and he is flying through life in the way that God designed us to live. And he says, when you look at him, when you look at him, you're not just alive to wonder, and, and you're not just formed in favor, but you are also aligned with design. Like you come into alignment with the way that God designed us to live. I was born in the 80s, but I'm, I'm a child of the 90s, and so whenever I hear that word truth, I think of that great movie, A Few Good Men. Is anyone with me? We're... we're where Jack Nicholson, right, he's, that, um, he, he's a, a military lawyer, and he looks across the courtroom, and he goes, you want the truth, right? You can't handle the truth, right? And if, if your neck, the vein in your neck doesn't bulge out when you say it, you're just, you're not doing it right, okay? And I think Jesus would say to us, can you handle my truth? Again, not just something to be known, but something to be lived, to, to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you, to let go of your lust and let go of your anger, to honor sexuality in the way that God designed it, to be generous with your time and resources. Like, can you handle the truth? And Jesus would say, look at me. If you want to know what that looks like, he goes, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. 
Can you handle it? And will you let him imprint, looking at you? Incarnation is about imprinting. Will you let him look at you and imprint his truth on your life? My guess is, in a space this big, that there are some of us and we are here and we are running from God's truth. But would you just let him speak to you this week? Would you just tell him, I'm open? Would you just imprint your truth on my life? I want to live in the way that you've designed me to live. Listen to the way that John ends this section. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This phrase sort of picks up a second meaning of grace upon grace. I think what John's doing in in all of his brilliance is he's telling us the law was a grace that God gave to his people. David says, I delight in your law. But he's saying now, in Jesus, in Jesus, there is a new, unique, and even greater grace that God has given his people in the face of Jesus. We can become God's children not by following the law, but through faith in Jesus. Amen? And the something new that God is doing is accomplished in the revelation of his character and his heart. Listen to the way that John ends this section. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he, Jesus, has made him known. That that word in the Greek is the word exegete, to make him known. He has taken God and he has shown us what God is ultimately, truly, and really like. He has put God on display. And so when Jesus imprints on us through incarnation and this personal God wants to speak to us personally, what he wants to do is he wants to show us God's heart. He wants to show us what God is ultimately, truly, and really like. Donald McCullough, an author, in a book that he wrote a a number of years ago called The Trivialization of God, he told this story about this high tower in the middle of Trafalgar Square in London. And on the top of this tower, it has um, Lord Admiral Nelson on the very top. Now, the problem with this tower, though, is that it's 160 feet up in the air. And so people would come to this tower, and what they noticed is that they would come and they would just stare up at this tower. And they They felt like, okay, like I don't know that this is necessarily accomplishing what we want to have had accomplished through putting Lord Admiral Nelson up on the top. And so here's what they did. Here's what they did. They took an exact replica of what was up on top, and they put it down below so that people could come and they could do this. Oh, oh, that's what I'm looking at up there. That makes all sense the sense in the world. And Jesus would say to you and to me tonight, that's exactly what God did in the incarnation. So we can look at him and go, oh, oh, that, that's what you're like. There's never been a time when God was unlike Jesus. There was never a time when Jesus did not reflect completely holy and totally the character of his father, as he would say to his friend Philip, if you've seen me, you have seen the father. If you want to know what God is like, look no further than Jesus. Look no further than Jesus. And so my question, I think that I just want to leave us with tonight is, will we allow the Spirit of God, to deconstruct some of the maybe preconceived notions and baggage that we bring into relationship with God, where our God in our mind doesn't look like Jesus? And will we allow him to imprint on us? Imprint his glory and beauty and majesty? Imprint his grace? His favor to you on your best day and on your worst day? Imprint his truth, his design for the way that he has called us to live. And imprint his heart. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There was never a time when God was unlike Jesus.
And see, here, here's the challenge. Knowing God personally is not an exercise in theology. It's not an attempt to try in our head to try to figure God out. Knowing God is central to who we become. It's central to the kind of life that we live. It's personal. It's personal. See, at the center of the universe is not artificial intelligence. At the center of the universe is not the force. At the center of the universe is not an organizing principle. At the center of the universe is God in three persons, blessed trinity. And here's the deal. If, if persons are at the center, then relationship is at the core. And I'm convinced that you are here at Mount Hermon this week, not just to know more things about God, but to encounter the God anew and afresh who's personal, who's present, who's here, and who wants to look at you and who wants to imprint his love afresh on you. The, the first 18 verses of John that, that we've worked our way through tonight a lot of people call him a prologue. I, I think it'd be better to call it an overture. An, an overture introduces musical themes like in an opera or maybe a movie that are going to repeat throughout the production. That's exactly what John has done here. He's introduced themes that are about to repeat throughout the rest of his book, themes of glory and grace and truth, and life, and light, and joy. And the question is, will you let him imprint those themes on you? Here's where I want to end. Um, uh, I don't have an actual picture of Jesus. That might surprise some of you, but I, I don't have one. <laughs> but there is this picture from the chosen that I just, I just love. And I think the thing that I love about this picture of Jesus is, um, is his eyes, is his eyes. And we've heard all these themes in the beginning of John's gospel, this, this overture, if you will, this declaration that Jesus is at the center of it all, that he wants to imprint his mercy, his goodness, his grace, his love on you. And so my question for us tonight is like, um, can you, can you hear that music? Like, can, you, can you hear the music that John is writing? And will you let him speak to your heart? It's personal. It's personal. It's not just an exercise in gaining more information. Will you let him imprint his grace and his mercy? His truth and his love on your heart. Let me just give you a few moments. We just bring that before God. Maybe just look at the screen and ask the Spirit to speak to you. And then I'll come close us in prayer in just a moment. So Jesus, the word, the word who became flesh to dwell among us. We, we want to dwell with you, Jesus. We, we want to see your glory. Would you, would you show it to us afresh this week? Would you show us your glory? We're going to pray that same bold prayer that Moses prayed. Would you show us your glory? 
And Jesus, would you shower your grace afresh, the grace that you purchased on the cross and through the resurrection. Would you open our eyes to truth? Are there ways that we're running away from you? Imprint that on us. And Jesus, thank you for revealing to us what your Father's like, that we might have confidence to boldly approach your throne to find grace and help in our time of need. We worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.